Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Well, may I thank first um, the, the family, which I believe is a kind of mafia that runs this uh, extraordinary association. And when Michael Scott, um, a former student of mine, when he mentioned to me that he was the president of this association, he left me with no choice but to come and meet you and talk with you and talk to you and talk at you. And I'm going to do all that. And please uh, feel free to come back at me at the end and we can have a, a discussion, even possibly a debate uh, in ancient Greek terms. And if you don't feel able or willing to speak up publicly, by all means, come and chat with me privately afterwards. Thanks, therefore, to, in particular, Katrina for such a lovely introduction and invitation. And I'm very pleased that the deputy head of AKS School is here with us this evening, or at least he was until he met me, and perhaps he's um, skedaddled uh, by now. So, ten things. Let's hope this uh, wonderful device works. It does. I have written a book, and it will come out on my birthday. It will be my 69th birthday on March the 24th. And what you're getting here is a not very sneak preview of some part of the ancient bit, because the book, uh, the title wasn't mine, but it traces uh, the concept uh, and the realities of democratia in the ancient Greek and Greek and Roman worlds, and then it traces its non-existence for about a thousand years, until in the 17th century, the notion that possibly ordinary people ought possibly to have more than just a say in their everyday lives on a political basis. And of course, I'm talking about the 17th century, what's sometimes called the English Revolution, or the regicide of 1649, which was preceded by debates in a church, St. Mary's in Putney, where I'm from, in South London, and these debates are known alternatively as the Putney debates or the Levellers debates. And Levellers was a word which was not their own. It's typical, isn't it, that um, political tendencies tend to be labeled by their enemies. And it's even possible that democratia, what we're talking about today, is a word coined not by Democrats. Uh, I'll explain that shortly. Levellers were accused of leveling down rather than leveling up and therefore um, denaturing the natural hierarchies of the good, the better, the best, and the very bad, which were somehow almost divinely enshrined. They started it off, the torch or the baton was picked up in the following century, in the 18th century, by first the Americans, who regarded our dear, beloved King George III as a tyrant, and they weren't afraid of calling him that. They rebelled, they revolted, and they won. So the United States. But were they Democrats? Well, read my book. They weren't in the ancient Greek sense. They hated what they understood to be ancient Greek democracy. Along comes the French Revolution. Well, they agreed that their monarch was also a tyrant, Louis XVI, and of course they did to him what the uh, English revolutionaries had done to Charles I, except they guillotined him rather than uh, beheaded him in another manner. And so the word democracy, originating 2,400, 500 years ago, re-emerging slowly, slowly, 18th, 19th century, as Katrina says, is now absolutely standard. We're all Democrats. Very few, uh, there are parties in uh, Europe not only in this country, which I would consider to be fascist or Nazi, and there is one of them in Greece, and they call themselves Golden Dawn. They're not Democrats. And they look back to the ancient Spartans for their inspiration. And that's very sad to me, but it's not surprising, because Hitler and his Nazi uh, ideology also look back to ancient Sparta. And it's actually very difficult today to speak up for the ancient Spartans. It's not so difficult to speak up for the ancient Athenians. And that's a paradox. If we'd gone back a couple of hundred years, 
And I'd come forward and said, look, guys, democracy is a good thing. And, you know, the Athenians invented it. And if only we could be a little more like them, everything would be a lot better. I would have been held down and uh, not given a cat for, to be honest. So, so much has happened in the last couple of hundred years to transform our understanding of what democracy is. So there's my little book, and I say quite a bit of what I've just said in that, and of course I also say a good deal more. I begin then, and I hope you've all got a handout, and I hope you can all see one or other screen. The handout should be on your um, place. It's not absolutely crucial. I speak with um, unexampled uh, transparency. But it, you might want to have it as an aid memoir uh, as you leave and contemplate the excitement of having been in this hall this evening. So, democratia is a portmanteau word. This is the first paragraph on your uh, handout. It combines two Greek words, demos and kratos. And so you get democratia, which those of you who do ancient Greek will know is in its gender, in its grammatical gender, a feminine noun. And therefore, when, as the Athenians did, they divinized their form of self-rule, democratia, of course they were going to represent her as a goddess. And on your screen, I'm sorry, I haven't got a pointer, but on the left-hand half of the slide is a representation of the top of a, a steely, a pillar, with below it a law which the Athenian assembly passed against tyranny. So we're back to George III and Louis XVI already. And the seated gentleman of a certain age, he's obviously middle-aged, too elderly, that's Demos, and Demos is a masculine noun, and he represents, he's the emblem of, the Athenian people, the average Athenian citizen thought of himself as being something like that gentleman sitting on a chair there. He's being crowned because the document below is going to defend democracy and therefore the power of the demos. He's being crowned by the patron goddess of the Athenian city or state, the polis, who was Athena. Now, Athena is technically female, but she emerged into the world not through the usual channels, but through the head of her father. So she's masculine from the word go, and she was born fully armed, in other words, with masculine armor. So though she's female, and in gender she is grammatical gender, she's feminine, She's not very feminine in the normal sense of the word. She's a warrior goddess who stands literally by her man. Uh, Tammy Wynette would appreciate the um, <laughs> point of that slide. Second paragraph on your uh, handout. Democratia is a combination of demos and kratos. Demos is relatively um, problematic. Kratos is not. And I put up a slide of Aeschylus because, as some of you may know, he's credited with a play, probably not actually by him, but by his son, and it's called Prometheus Bound. Prometheus was a god, an older god, than the generation of Athena and her father Zeus. And Zeus and uh, Prometheus fell out in a very big way. And one reason was that Zeus wanted, in effect, to see the end of pesky mankind. Zeus wanted to rule, but in a world where there were no humans. Prometheus took the side of us, mortals, humans. And he did a couple of things which made our lives not just bearable, but possible. He stole fire. He stole it from Olympus, Zeus's domain, mountain in North Greece, and he put it in a fennel stalk and he transmitted it to humans so that they could keep warm, so that they could cook, 
so that they could survive. Zeus punished Prometheus extremely by having him chained to a mountain in what's now Turkey, the Caucasus, such that every day an eagle, which was Zeus's bird, came and attacked Prometheus, ate his liver, and left him, because he was immortal, he couldn't die, in agony, but alive. Overnight, every night, Greeks have uh, a wonderful imagination, not always a very pleasant imagination. Prometheus's liver would grow back to its original state, such that the following day, the Zeus's eagle could come and eat it, and so on. So in other words, he was tortured until he was finally released by another um, immortal uh, who took pity on him, and Zeus had to put up with that. Well, in uh, the play that Aeschylus is credited with, Zeus has a henchman, and he's called Kratos. You probably know all actors in Greek drama were masked, so presumably the mask of Kratos was particularly fearsome and horrible and vicious. And his job was to do Zeus's will in a most unpleasant, violent way. So Kratos means power strength. No one would be any doubt that's what it meant. Demos, however, and this is where your handout may be helpful, can mean either the people as a whole, all the people, or it can mean a subsection of the people, namely the masses, the majority. And just to say, and I'm sure this is well known, that when we're talking about power, in ancient Greece, political power. We're only talking about the male half of any ancient population. And that goes, of course, for every country in the world until the late 19th century. So it's not that the Greeks were odd. Uh, they were perfectly and sadly chauvinistically normal. So the people, all the people, well, who does that remind you of? Abraham Lincoln. Gettysburg Address, 1863. We are, he said, here on the battlefield, Gettysburg. We look back to the establishment of what he calls democracy, namely government of the people, by the people, for the people. Well, that rather left out, as I said, women and, of course, slaves. Uh, there were no uh, free um, there were very few free, free blacks in 1776, at the time of the Declaration of Independence, and there were a great many slaves still. And of course, that's what the Civil War was being fought partly about in the 1860s. But what about the other meaning, the less um, comfortable, the more um, tendentious and uh, potentially threatening meaning of demos as the masses? majority, because the majority tends in every society to be poor. And if you're poor in many societies, that's regarded as a kind of affliction. You know, you deserve to be poor. It's not an accident that you're poor. You, sh you should be poor. Well, if you have a regime in which the poor are the majority and they have the Kratos, what do they have Kratos over? Well, two possibilities. One is, as it were, the organs of government. So the kratos of the demos could mean the masses, because they are more numerous than the elite, they rule the state. But suppose you're one of the elite. You're not thrilled at the thought that somebody who is poor should actually have power at all, let alone, because there are more of them, have power over you. That is when the meaning, and I've been deliberately anachronistic on the handout by quoting V.I. Ulyanov, who is better known to some of us as Lenin, the dictatorship of the proletariat was what he advocated as the first stage of post-capitalist Russian and then global uh, politics. So it's not a nice thing it's the masses gripping power in order to suppress 
others who might wish to take that power away from them. And that is the ambiguity, that is the tension in the word democratia. And that's why I suggested it's even possible, we can't say for sure, that it was invented by its opponents, meaning the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, you'll have noticed dictatorship, proletariat, Latin-based words. Well, most, I think probably a majority, of our English political vocabulary is derived from Greek rather than from Latin. Pretty much all of it is either Greek or Latin. And I put on the handout on the uh, slide as well um, some examples of the two sources of our political vocabulary. So from Greek, we have what you see on the screen there. Aristocracy, monarchy, oligarchy, tyranny I've mentioned already. Plutocracy, that's the same kratos as in democracy. Anybody who spells that with an S at the end, come and see me afterwards. Uh, anarchy, and of course democracy. One could add autocracy, self-kratos. Dynasty, from the Greek word for power in a sense of capacity. Dunamai, dunamis, dynamite, uh, but dynasty. Dunastia. On the other hand, from Latin, citizens, ultimately from uh, kiwis, kiwitas, kiwitates, citizens. Constitution, something that's set together, con stato, statuo, constitution. Empire, from imperium. Latin had couple of words for power, potestas, which is like Greek dunamis, potential, capacity, and on the other hand, imperium, a very strong form of power from which imperial, imperious, and empire uh, come. And beyond that, liberal, from the, Greek, the Latin word for free, and I'll come back to liberal democracy, later on. Republic, the people's thing, raise, populica, populicus is the adjective of populus, race is thing, raise, publica, gives us republic, state, a, a state, a condition, but also something established, standing as a political entity, and power from potestas, and people from populus. Despite the fact that our vocabulary is Greco-Roman. That borrowing, that inheritance, disguises what I think is probably the key point about uh, the distinction between antiquity and modernity so far as politics is concerned. Namely, that theirs, all their forms of rule, self-rule, were direct, and that applies to democracy, which if you want a very short definition of ancient Greek democracy in its original meaning, it was government by mass meeting, for which the only equivalent, I guess, today, if they still exist, would be a mass meeting of a trades union. And to an ancient Greek, suppose we were to put an ancient Greek in a time machine, bring him rather than her back to witness what goes on in this country and other democracies, of which there are many types throughout the world, an ancient Greek would say, you don't have democracy, you have oligarchy. And the reason for that, the rule of the few, is that we don't rule, we the people, the ordinary people, don't rule directly ourselves. We choose people to rule for us, to rule for us in two senses. One, instead of us, we're not actually in government. And secondly, we hope <laughs> on our behalf for us in that uh, positive sense. So there's one paradox, and we're going to have quite a few paradoxes this evening. Um, we call ourselves Democrats. We use an ancient Greek term, but an ancient Greek Democrat would call us oligarchs. 
There were about 1,000 separate Greek, ancient Greek, political states, communities, most of them of the polis, this is where political comes from, and nature. That's to say, polis is a citizen state, city state, citizen state. And of those thousand or so, which as you can see, scattered all over the Mediterranean, round the Black Sea, uh, only a minority ever had some form of democracy. And I should say that um, Aristotle, the greatest analyst of ancient Greek politics, identified four sub-types of democracy. So, there was no such thing as ancient Greek democracy. There were lots of polis, cities, which had forms of democratic constitution, but those forms of democratic constitution differed. Athens originated democracy, no doubt coined the word democratia, but it, within a couple of hundred years, had no fewer than three different democracies. Not at the same time, but successively different types, degrees of democracy. Most known ancient Greek writers, historians, theorists, people who commented on democratia as a political form in a theoretical way were typically hostile to it. That's another paradox. Uh, we're all Democrats today. They were all not Democrats then. And <coughs> among the commentators, the critics, perhaps the severest uh, critic, the most hostile critic, in all antiquity, critic, of course, a good word from the Greeks, a judge, was the man on your left uh, on the slide. Plato. Plato's real name may have been something else. It's thought it's possibly a nickname because he was a very broad, um, thuggish sort of type uh, as a youth. And uh, he wrestled. Wrestling was then a very upper class Greek uh, activity, uh, rather unlike um, how most wrestling uh, is today. And what he despised, what he disliked most, was the notion that ordinary people, most of whom were ill-educated or not educated at all, probably stupid, certainly ignorant, possibly unstable in their outlooks and their judgment. People such as those were actually running states in democracies. And in particular, remembering what I said about dictatorship of the proletariat, they were dictating to people like him smart guys, uh, intelligent guys. Of course, Plato was extreme. He took the view that only certain things could be known, and only very few people had genuine knowledge of those things, as opposed to belief, false or true, about them. And his own prescription, famously in a work we call The Republic, it is, of course, a Latin term, was for philosopher kings. In other words, to qualify to be a king, a kind of um, oligarch, you had to be born incredibly smart. You had to undergo a platonic education so that you understood how the world really was, as Plato alone, or pretty much alone, could tell you. And then, because of your education, your innate knowledge, your platonic upbringing and qualifications, you simply would know the right answer to political problems. Well, um, I just happen not to be in sympathy with any of that program, from its ideological underpinnings to its alleged political efficacy. I say there are very few, you can count on the fingers of one hand pretty much, those ancients, those people who we know and whose works have survived or whose words have survived in some form of hardly any were ideological pro-Democrats. One of them is on your screen, at least an image of a version of what he might have looked like. And of course, 
Plato would hate the fact it's an image of an image of an image. Uh, he wanted reality only. But anyway, it's Pericles. Pericles of Athens, born in the early 5th century BC, aristocratic background, but from the very first thing that we know he did politically, which was to fund a play, a series of plays by Aeschylus, when he was only in his early 20s, right the way through his career, he always thought that the rule, the kratos of the masses, in the demos in that sense, was the way to go. Even when, actually, it cost him for a brief period his own career, uh, he was briefly fined, deposed. Uh, nevertheless, as far as we know, he didn't waver in his view that democratia of the Athenian sort was the way to go. Um, we might differ on his own policies. Uh, how wise were they? Or were the Athenians in a position to carry out what he may have thought to be the wisest policy? These are issues I was talking with a couple of people immediately before this talk about the so-called Peloponnesian War, which the Athenians lost. Well, was it partly Pericles' fault they lost because of the way he had um, encouraged Athenians to habitually behave? Well, we'll never know. Another of the guys, and it's on your handout, who was a Democrat uh, in ideology is Democritus. And I've written a little book about him, very little, it's only 50 pages long. He was an atomist. He was one who believed that all matter is either atoms, that's things that you can't cut, atomos, or the void, it's nothing else. And he had a very uh, enlightened view, I think, about the capacity of ordinary people to run their own lives. And he was known as the cheerful philosopher. Uh, he, he looked on the bright side, whereas I would like to think, or I tend to think Plato was the exact inverse of that, sort of rather miserableist um, character. Anyhow, moving on. Our earliest piece of extant political theory, another Greek word, theoria, contemplation, comes in the histories, another word from the Greek, the inquiries of Herodotus. Herodotus was not an Athenian, he came from a city in what's today Turkey, Western Turkey, Halicarnassus, which is modern Bodrum. And those of you who like windsurfing have perhaps uh, already discovered the delights of uh, Halicarnassus, Bodrum. He was the first, um, I suppose one might say genuine, uh, in some sense um, ancestral to what I do, historian of ancient Greece. And he chose for his subject uh, a massive project and problem. The invasion of the Greek mainland by a massive amphibious Persian force in 480, 479, preceded by an earlier purely naval attack which resulted in the Battle of Marathon. And Herodotus' problem was this. Why, how did the Persians not win? And if they had won, what would the Greek world I, Herodotus, was brought up in, what would it have been like? Massive questions. Well, in amongst his, um, uh, divided later into nine books, in what we call book three, between chapters 80 and 82, he stages a debate. And this has all sorts of problems, which I'm not gonna go into. Well, one of them that I will just mention is that the speakers are not Greeks, they're Persians. And they're noble Persians and they're conspirators. And the historical situation, the dramatic situation, is that the Persian Empire, which was founded by Cyrus the Great, succeeded by his son Cambyses. Well, Cambyses either committed suicide or was murdered. And a usurper took over. Seven noble Persians, including members of the royal family, conspire to overthrow the usurper and restore legitimate government. Question, what form of regime should we establish once we have restored legitimate government? Well, to me, the very scenario is fantastic. Persians were not in the habit of debating theoretically. At this period, issues which only were theorized in the Greek world 75 years later. 
at the earliest. So it's utterly fantastic that this should happen. What you have then is a Greek debate between rule by all, rule by some, or rule by one, conducted in a historical context between somebody who advocates a form of democracy, somebody who advocates a form of oligarchy, and somebody who advocates a form of monarchy. And the gentleman in the debate who advocates a form of monarchy, astonishingly enough, is the guy you see in this slide on the left-hand side, because he is Darius in Persian Dariush. Darius I, Darius the Great, who indeed became king once the usurper had been usurped and legitimate, that is, autocratic monarchy had been reestablished. So what do the various speakers in Herodotus' debate argue? I'm going to leave aside Darius, obviously, he thinks that the rule of one strong man who is good and wise, better than anything else. The advocate of aristocracy, um, the best, aristos means best, kratos, aristocracy, rule of the best. It's a sort of no-brainer, isn't it, that the best should rule. Who were the best? Now, this is, of course, Greek, elite, upper class, well-born, wealthy, with pedigrees going back to gods and heroes. This is what the Persian advocates who believes in rule by some. But the one that interests me is, of course, the, as it were, democracy speaker, who advocates not democratia. He doesn't use that word. He advocates isonomia. This is on your handout. Equality under the laws. And why does he advocate that? Why does he not advocate democratia? Because, I mean, he doesn't say this, but you and I can infer, isonomia has the fairest of names, according to this speaker. So fairer, in other words, than democratia, because democratia can be interpreted to mean mob rule, dictatorship of the proletariat, bad. So what is isonomia? Well, it has three things which distinguish it, according to this speaker, from either aristocracy or monarchy, and which are collectively superior to any alternative. All officials, all people who hold an office, an archi in Greek, that's where the monarchy bit, uh, oligarchy, means rule, all shall be selected by the lottery, randomly. Name in a hat, pulled out of a hat. Why? Because election. You and I may think elections very democratic. We may think what's going on in the American presidential races is a form of democracy. Uh, no, um, because according to a Democrat, election favors the notables. Latin word notabilis gives us nobilis, noble. And very few people are noble. You've got to be rich, well-born, well-educated, and all the rest. You're one of the elite. So for an ancient Greek Democrat, elections are oligarchic. Secondly, once chosen by the lot, ideally, all officials must be responsible to the people. Now we, every five years or so, have a chance to make our elected representatives responsible. Once every five years. Um, a friend of mine wrote a book in which he said, this is like the Saturnalia in Rome, where for one day the slaves ruled over their masters, which was a way of saying that for the other 364 days, slaves were slaves. Well, we are slaves for uh, not just 364 days, but for four times 365 plus 364 and we get one day in five years when we make our re elected representatives responsible. Oops, that's not this way. Hang on. Sorry, I'll go back. Hey, 
Yes, that was the one. Sorry, I, I went on uh, uh, a little far. So, isonomia. Mathematicians among you know all about isosceles triangles. Isoskeles. Skeles, skelos is a leg. Equal legs. Exactly equal. Mathematically equal legs. Ancient Greek Democrats were radical egalitarians. One citizen, one vote, regardless of birth, wealth, height, beauty, strength, intelligence. Everyone counts for one, no one for more than one, and votes should be counted, and ideally publicly, as well as privately by secret ballot. And so, if you wanted, for example, to serve the state of Athens in a democratic way, there were two major ways in which you as an ordinary citizen could do so. One is by turning up to the mass meeting, that's to say the assembly, which eventually came to meet every nine days. Can you imagine having a referendum every nine days? Uh, and on several different topics. So, three or four referendums on one day every nine days. It beggars the imagination. They got paid. If you turned up, you get a small compensation, but it was uh, enough to compensate you for the loss of earnings or loss of income for attending the assembly. The other way, and this is um, really quite interesting, <laughs> is through serving as a juryman. So every year, beginning of each year, it was a huge lottery in which 6,000 people who had put their names forward, 6,000 would be chosen by the lot randomly to serve on the panel, which was impaneled for a year. And then every so often, and roughly it's one day in two, a court would be sitting somewhere. And you, if you wish to be considered to become a juryman for that day, in a particular trial on that day. You roll up, you present your token, it's put in the relevant receptacle, it's pulled out or not, and you serve or you do not serve, you get paid if you do get uh, uh, chosen. And on the slide, there is a juror's token at the bottom, made of bronze, has his name hammered into it, incised into it, and his um, local affiliation, where he came from, his, his home village. And above, you've got um, various um, ballots that say what jurymen cast, um, solid or uh, hollow, for guilt or innocence in a trial. And this is an extremely important point. It's often forgotten that this is doing democracy, being a juryman. We tend to think of democracy as elections, voting in assemblies of one kind or another. For the ancients, serving as a juryman was doing your democratic duty. And of course, there's a residual um, element of that. Twelve jury uh, chosen by lot. I served once. I was dismissed because there was a technical procedural problem. So the whole trial had to be halted and started again. But I got a bit of a sense of what it is to be part of a jury. Well, the Athenians uh, went in for huge juries. Smallest, 201. The smallest going up to 6,000. All of them at once. And the normal size, the size of the one, for example, that tried Socrates for impiety against the gods, against the uh, interests of the city of Athens, was a jury of 501. The one, of course, to avoid uh, the possibility of a tie. I put on the handout the fact that the Spartans, who were not Democrats in the ancient Greek sense, did not vote by using a single token or by raising their hands. They voted by shouting. Well, if you were a six foot six sort of Heraclean figure, as opposed to, I mean, Spartans were tough, but nevertheless, um, let's say you're only five foot eight and your voice is more of a tenor than it is of a double bass. Um, clearly, there's no notion of equality 
people's shouts are not going to be one citizen, one shout. That's how the Spartans did it. They never used the lot to choose their officials. They always elected them, and they always elected them by shouting, which means that a small group of um, citizens, elite citizens, judged which shouts were the loudest for the relevant candidates. Well, you can see the scope for, um, shall we say, crookedness uh, here. And Aristotle actually refers to this, and he refers to the system as uh, laughable, simply a joke. Um, it can't be taken seriously. However, and now I come on to the slide that I did mean to put on before. In one respect, no ancient Greek democrat was an egalitarian. And it's the point I've made already that uh, they were gender bound. They were, uh, if you like, male chauvinist about the capacity of the female half of the population to exercise political judgment and wield political power. And so I put on the uh, slide here, it's an inscription on a bit of stone, a statue base, which proclaims in the voice of a Spartan princess that she was the first woman in the whole Greek world to win the prize, the crown, of an Olympic victor, which she won because she owned a four-horse chariot, which won the Olympic four-horse chariot. She did not herself drive the chariot, but an Athenian male Democrat, egalitarian amongst himself, were he to have seen that, and I expect quite a few of them did, would have been utterly appalled at the notion of a woman speaking out in public, in her own voice, in a predominantly masculine world, where you probably know women not only were not allowed to compete in the Olympics, in any of the athletics or the weight or other contests, they weren't allowed to watch the Olympics in the athletics and um, the wrestling and so on, uh, because they were simply barred. So, in one respect, no ancient Greek Democrat was an egalitarian. And I put on the handout a little joke, well, it's meant to be a joke, and it's contained in a work of Plutarch's. Plutarch lived in the second century of our era, hundreds of years after the period I'm talking about, but he had access to lots of sources, including sources about this lady here, Kynisca. And the joke goes like this, an Athenian comes up to a Spartan, and it might well have been at Olympia, because that was one of the few places they might actually meet together in peace rather than in war. And he asks a Spartan, why is it that you Spartans don't have democracy, like as we have in Athens? And the Spartan, of course, you probably know our English word laconic comes from Spartan. He has a snappy reply. He says, we will introduce democracy into our public decision-making just as soon as you Athenians introduce democracy into your own home. It's a patriarchal, chauvinist society. And so we come to the uh, final slide. And as I say, my book is a, a life of, of democracy. The original concept, how it changed between the fourth century BC and the Roman occupation of Greece. You probably know the Romans conquered Greece and famously Horace said that captive Greece took its fierce conqueror captive. In other words, the Romans adopted much Greek culture, but one part of ancient Greek culture they refused to adopt was democracy. Uh, they squashed it wherever they could find. The rule of the people was not to their taste. They had a form of republicanism in Rome, but it was very managed, top-down, a form of oligarchy, really replaced, of course, by autocracy. Augustus and his followers. Well, for about, I suppose, getting on for a thousand years in the Middle Ages, um, democracy, democratia, had no existence, really. It was a sort of shadowy uh, form. They'd heard about it, uh, but it didn't exist. Well, 
just before the uh, ancient world, or what I consider to be really the end of the ancient world, before it ends, in the 6th century of our era, the reign of Justinian, who was a Byzantine ruler ruling from Constantinople, now uh, Istanbul, though he called himself a Roman because he was a Roman citizen continuing the Roman Empire. In his reign, a source writes about a riot that took place in Constantinople. You probably know that the Constantinopolitans loved uh, the racing, um, chariot racing, and they divided up into factions, especially greens and blues and so on. Well, a contemporary of Justinian referring to a riot resulting from a result that certain people didn't welcome refers to it as democratia. So the word that starts out, maybe controversially, rule of the people, rule of the masses, in orderly state-governed um, politics, within a thousand years, has come so far down the social scale that it can be used to mean merely mob rule. And so that leaves us with the final paradox, which is of democracy's sort of upward mobility since the early modern period. And I put on the handout, the past is a foreign country. I quote here L.P. Hartley, the go-between. In some ways, the Greeks and the Romans are quite like us. In other ways, very like us. But in other ways, and in some ways, the most interesting and important, they're very unlike us indeed. So if you have been, thank you for listening. Yes and no. I mean, no, because uh, all ancient systems were direct. They didn't have governments, let alone cabinets, let alone prime ministers. So from that point of view, any ancient system was unlike any modern one. Secondly, Sparta was, and there's a debate among scholars, how different, how strange was it in its own terms in those days. And I put on the, the board there, Kyniska, and she says that her dad and two of her brothers were kings of Sparta. Well, you might think, okay, kings, we've got a queen, and yet we think we can somehow combine that with some form of popular representation. The Spartans had an assembly. They had a senate, and that's your point, isn't it? Sort of an upper house and a lower house. But they also had not one, but two kings who automatically were members of, as it were, the upper house, the senate. So the ancient Spartan polity was um, an extremely managed, top-down political system where the ordinary Spartan, who was a soldier in the assembly, who shouted, would typically shout assent to what was already the agreed policy of the elite. So rather than deciding between policies after debate on issues, pragmatic, theoretical, it would be more of a hurrah, and the Spartan Assembly would be more like a revivalist meeting than it would be like an Athenian Assembly, which could lead to extreme dissension and tension, with one exception, and possibly you're one of those who has read um, Thucydides, and Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War begins, almost at the beginning, with a debate in the Spartan Assembly, at which more than one Spartan speaks, and speaks in different tenses, different senses, advocating different courses of action. Foreign ambassadors also speak. And at the end of the speeches, they have a vote. 
their usual method, they shout. And the guy who's in the chair, and those of you who've ever been part of any committee will know about the power of the chair. Um, the chair, in this case, was the senior EFOR, where EFOR means overseer, supervisor. And he said, I'm terribly sorry, he didn't say that, of course, he said it much more crudely, I, I can't tell which of the shouts was louder. And it was basically two. The issues were, do we go to war with Athens now, or do we go to war with Athens later? So it wasn't a huge um, debate, you know, do we not go to war with Athens at all? That wasn't on the, on, on the table. And in order to be absolutely clear, uh, this is as far as we know the one and only such occasion, the presiding, the chairman said, I want you to divide, as is done in the House of Commons. So you go into the eyes or the nose. And he would say, right, at that end, those of you who think the Athenians have broken the peace, we should uh, prepare for war now, which, by the way, is the view I happen to share. Or those of you, you know, pathetic people who are really a bit cowardly, aren't you, if you don't want to go to war immediately with it, uh, would you please go to that end of the assembly? And astonishingly, a large majority voted for not only the Athenians having broken the peace, but that the Spartans should attack them, as it were, tomorrow. In other words, as soon as they could mobilize. And since the Spartans were on the almost, you know, ready for war at any moment, it wouldn't have taken very long for them to mobilize. So that's pretty alien to an Athenian way of deciding. And it's not very much like our way for one obvious reason. I was one of the perhaps two million people Estimates differ, who in 2003 marched to Hyde Park in favor of, or at least I was in favor of the view, that before Tony Blair declared war on Saddam Hussein in the name really of the United States, not of the United Kingdom, the issue should be referred both by America and by the United Kingdom to the Security Council of the UN. Nearly two million, but actually I found myself near some extreme Islamists who thought the enemy was not George Bush, but it was Bush, but it was the state of Israel. Because America supports Israel in the Middle East. This is against Bush, therefore it's okay for me to march against Israel in this. Well, anyway, uh, that happened to be where I was standing in the march. But did the cabinet have a vote on whether or not we should join the Americans in the disastrous invasion of Iraq? Possibly, informally, you know, a kind of consensus. Did the House of Commons formally declare war on... Of course not. So there was a debate, but this is where cabinet government, and in particular prime ministerial the Americans have a presidential democracy. We had previously a parliamentary democracy, but it's become more and more a prime ministerial cabinet democracy. Um, that's very different from an Athenian situation where here's the issue, X speaks, Y speaks, yes, no, different points of view, then you raise your hands, and if there's any doubt about the vote, then you uh, vote with a ballot, with a stone or some other token, and you count the votes and that's it. And it's the people who turn up, who are the Athenian people for that moment, who decide. And that's very alien, I think, to our way of thinking. And you might say with good reason, because what do we know? I mean, um, when the world has become, as it has become, globalized, when what happens in China affects the stock market in London and Frankfurt, um, this is unbelievable in ancient Athenian or ancient Greek terms. And so one has to be extremely cautious about calling referendums on anything because look what's happened with Brexit. Already it's having a disastrous effect on the pound as against the euro. Uh, it will have further disastrous effects regardless of which way the vote goes. The, the damage is already done by calling the referendum in the way it's been called 
I don't remember there being a mass movement of British people signing a huge petition like the Chartists signed a huge petition in the 1830s to democratize the British way of doing politics. I don't remember a mass upsurge of demand for a referendum on Brexit. You know, just we don't do things the same way as they did once and sometimes it might be better if we did, sometimes. Silence stunned you all into silence. <laughs> yeah, the, it's not an exact parallel, but there is a Greek word koinon, which literally means something which is common. And it became the technical term for a union of initially people of the same ethnicity, so all Boeotians, all Arcadians, and then it becomes extended to mean all members of a federation. So were Europe, um, I use the word the European Union, to be a federal union with a central place, Brussels or wherever, where decisions were made by delegates from the different constituent members, allies, then that would count in ancient Greek, and by that I mean post-classical. This is typically a phenomenon of the third, second centuries, the moment between the conquest of Greece by Philip and Alexander of Macedon and the conquest of Greece by the Romans. In that sort of interval of third, second century, koina sprang up in mainland Greece and elsewhere. And they would not have found a federal European Union in principle odd. Obviously what they would have found extraordinary is scale, the millions and millions of us, if you aggregate all our populations. It's thought that there were perhaps only eight million people. You remember the map I showed you of the, the Greek world? Eight million in total, less than the population of London. So, um, Scale is an enormous difference, and scale means not just difference of size, but difference of quality. That um, one can't think about the European Union as one might think about a Hellenistic Greek federal state in which, in principle, all the allies might, by walking, um, be within a few days of each other, just by walking. Yeah, I wouldn't say there was any one Greek system, but those cities which had systems of democracy risked division. And there's a Greek word which, oddly enough, we borrow, but we give it a completely different meaning, and it's stasis. And today that means steady state. But if you go to Athens and you want to catch a bus, and you look on the bus stop, you'll see it's called stasis. And uh, those of you who do ancient Greek know stasis means a standing apart, dissension, civil strife, even civil war. And the joke goes that um, when the bus comes, you understand why it's called stasis. But no, um, it actually provoked tension because every vote, if it was a major issue, not just merely um, administrative, if it was a fundamental, like membership of the EU, then if you lose it, and let's say you lose it by a small majority, you're going to feel more angry probably <laughs> than you did before you went into the debate, not knowing yet whether you were going to lose it or not. So the answer to your question is that the ancient system empowered the masses, ordinary people, extraordinarily, but ran the severe risk of civil dissension and, um, at the limit, outright civil war involving bloodshed. And there are many, many cases of unpleasantness, shall we say, 
um, people getting clubbed to death, stabbed to death, in political terms, over political issues, and including over, do we want a democracy? Do we want a different sort of democracy? Or do we want an oligarchy? If so, what sort of oligarchy? Thank you. Um, Professor Cartridge, when I came up here to thank you, I was going to start off by saying I had two complaints to begin with, um, but I now have three complaints because um, <laughs> I, I worked in the public transport industry all my life and so I now discover you're making cheap shots in my industry oh. by, uh, <coughs> by commenting about bus services. So there will be, uh, there'll be some complaints. I'll certainly deal with that later. <laughs> my second complaint was that um, you've given me yet another book I have to put on my wish list uh, for the, uh, later <laughs> in the year. Uh, the third complaint is that you promised us 10 things uh, about democracy, but you've given us far more things to think about and far more things that we can reflect upon uh, as we finish this lecture today, because um, you, you made us think that in, in many ways uh, democracy is something that's easier to define about what it isn't than rather than what it is and how it has evolved uh, uh, over the centuries, yeah. and that was yeah. uh, really quite a, uh, an important revelation for me. And you reminded us that politics is largely a, an art rather than a science, it evolves, it continues to, to, be, to be debated and, and, uh, and to evolve. And really it's a time of increasingly important debate <coughs> about the role and power of national institutions, local institutions, international institutions, whether that's the ability of the United Nations to solve Syria or whether it's a deb debate with a referendum that I'll only be happy with if I get the answer I want um, about the role of the United Kingdom in, in Europe. It's important to understand the historical context and the pitfalls and the benefits of a form of government which, frankly, <coughs> we uh, take for granted at our peril. So you've given us a wonderful insight into all that, Professor, um, and I'm very grateful uh, for that. Uh, you've given us an introduction to the subject, and you've given us a book that we can look out for a little later in the year to learn even more about it. So I'm sure that our friends and colleagues here from the association and our guests as well would be like to join me in thanking you for that. <laughs>